crap, money, too much money. This is what I need most and what I least want to get, at least in this way. I expected to find old, worn-out socks, t-shirts, and pants. Instead, I found cash. Lots of cash. Damn it. Who the hell would own a little turquoise suitcase other than me? I didn't even take a second look before grabbing it at the airport. This thing was so ugly that I was ashamed to be with it. The color was so disgusting that after a brief phase of enthusiasm, even my wife decided that I should be the one to use it. We were in debt, which was greatly contributed to by her shopping habits and lack of income, so it was impossible to throw away the item. Time after time, I hoped that he would finally break under my harsh treatment and the treatment of the airport workers, but, as if to spite me, he refused to die. The advantage was that it stood out like a beacon of crude bad taste on any luggage carousel, and I was sure that no one would ever steal it. But I did not expect that I would ever meet a second one like him. Nevertheless, it happened. This suitcase is not mine. Some other loser had apparently fallen prey to his shopaholic wife, and I accidentally grabbed his suitcase. For some strange reason, the joyful thought flashed through my mind that I had finally gotten rid of mine. Along with the damn thing, I lost my favorite banana slugs t-shirt and some of my tools. Instead, I received hundred-dollar bills. My instruments were quite heavy, and my employer was used to paying for the excess because he was too stingy to let me fly business class. I'm used to carrying around 30 kilos, so when I grabbed the suitcase from the carousel, the weight felt right. A quick Google search on my phone showed that 30 kilos of cash was roughly equal to $3 million. Damn it. How can any self-respecting criminal organization hire someone who managed to lose an ugly turquoise suitcase containing several million dollars? If that idiot had done his job, I wouldn't have this damn problem. There is no way this money could be legal. Nobody carries millions in such an ugly suitcase. This money was just as dirty as the old man's jokes, and as I assumed, its owners were not famous for their politeness and humor. The money and I were now in very close proximity, and if the owner found us this way, I would be dead and he would return the money. I had no problem with the latter, but was less enthusiastic about the former. The problem seemed unique. What to do with too much money? Just throw them away somewhere? What if I was recorded by some surveillance camera? Some dirty Tony or one-eyed Luigi might want to talk to me about this. While my feet are in a bucket of cement and my teeth are scattered on the floor, they might be mortally disappointed to learn that I threw away their money just to get rid of them. No, it was impossible to throw them away. How about returning them? Well, who? It seems important to ask the right Gopnik. Hey, you look like a criminal. Could you take three million from me? We'll probably end in a positive response. But Dirty Tony won't like it either. The only solution seemed to be to keep them. Use them to buy yourself protection. No. The only way is not to use them at all. No one should ever know that I have them. What's more, it could save me a few fingers or my life if the money is full when Dirty Tony comes to visit me. I frantically tried to remember if there was anything in my suitcase that could indicate my identity, but I could not remember anything. Slowly, I closed the suitcase again, not wanting to even look at the money, and wondered how I would do my job without my tools and where I would find a toothbrush. Vinny said my car needs a new transmission. Misfortune. You might as well finally do something about the leaking faucet. Pure misfortune. I hated being on the road. The droplets are driving me crazy. I also hated coming home. Why, exactly, did I continue to live anyway? Laziness. Clara's husband fixes these things right away. Clara's husband mostly stays at home while I work like hell. Mentioning this again would not improve anything. I knew this for sure. I tried. I was really experienced at being miserable. It was the only thing I was really good at. You don't do anything for me. Nothing. Of course, there was no point in arguing. Years ago, I briefly thought about recording these conversations so that I could just play the recording instead of talking. I didn't expect such a move to improve anything, so I usually just stayed silent instead. I went to Clara's, do something here for a change. This is how my loving wife greeted me. 
No, welcome, no, I missed you, just regular arguments. Of course, I wasn't friendly to her either. We were in such an unhappy relationship where no one remembers how everything went wrong. Yeah, I missed you too, I replied sarcastically. Stop this nonsense. My wife, the last of the great romantics. Closing the door put a merciful end to the unpleasant conversation. Sighing, I headed to the kitchen. I took the empty glass. Always the same. Three pieces of ice. Diet Coke. Small black bowl. Potato chips. Always in exactly the same place on the couch. Cola on the corner of the small table. The chips are right next to it. Next is the remote control. Always neatly aligned. I looked at him and felt sick. I could go crazy. Who lives such a life? Repeating the same thing over and over again. It wouldn't be so bad if it didn't make me so miserable. I couldn't stop my thoughts from going back to the suitcase. Could this be my escape from this living nightmare? Sure, I'm risking my life, but is risking what I called my life really such a bad thing? Sometimes I still wanted to be dead. The problem is that although I didn't enjoy life, I was afraid of dying. No, the suitcase was not a solution to anything. It was just another problem. Damn, I have to remember to hide it. It could barely stay in my trunk. Half an hour later, I returned to the sofa in a good mood. The old treehouse left by the previous tenants, which Doris endlessly begged me to tear down, was the perfect place to hide. The thing was absurdly high on a huge tree, so I never intended to actually put it away. I felt good from this shelter and from the broken monotony of my life. For the first time in years, I felt excited. 3,000? Seriously? For the damn gearbox? Unfortunately, yes. Doris was in a fairly calm mood this morning, and I didn't want to rock the boat too much. I had no idea how we were going to come up with that amount of money, but she acted as if she at least acknowledged the problem and didn't just dump it on my shoulders. What about Vinny? Can he help? I suggested. Vinny was Doris's cousin. In my opinion, this man was a complete asshole. He was a huge guy and supported his enemy with all his might kindness to me at any time. He also owned a dilapidated car repair shop. When I asked for something, I could be sure that he would set the special family price by adding 10%. Doris liked him, perhaps a little too much, so she might be able to persuade him to help. That's already Vinny's price. Damn it. New gearbox. We had no money at all, except for a paltry three million in cash lying in the old treehouse. All our problems would end if I just used them, but maybe my life would end too. No, I couldn't use them. My life may not be worth much, but hopefully it's worth more than a Maeda transmission. Listen, I'll try to find a used one on eBay. All we need is Vinny's lift and maybe some advice and help. He won't like it. Yes, he probably wanted to take advantage of our bad luck to make some money. I'll see what I can do. Damn, this guy was clearly following me. He was pretending to stock shelves at our local supermarket. I'll admit, he was damn good at handling the packages like he'd been doing it forever. But I saw right through him. Where was the original shelf stacker? This one was dark and muscular. They usually had a skinny guy for the job. What happened to him? I imagined his body lying somewhere in the forest and felt sorry for the boy. I quickly grabbed the few things I was assigned to buy and left the store as quickly as possible, trying to look calm and indifferent. In the parking lot, I immediately noticed another unfamiliar face. He was throwing paper into the trash can, but like the stocking guy, he was watching me as discreetly as possible. Did they send a team of two assassins, or were these guys just testing me? Damn it, I was going crazy. No self-respecting mobster would stalk shelves or throw away trash just to kill a nobody like me. They would just do it and go about their business. However, the underlying feeling of panic was difficult to suppress, and I kept looking at the rear mirror on the way back home. Thank you so much, honey. Dora squealed as soon as I delivered my groceries. This shocked me even more than the strangers in the supermarket. Doris was nice to me. Why now? Could this be a coincidence? Unlikely, but how could she have known about the money? How should I even react? I'm no longer used to peaceful conversations at home. 
Cheers, honey, I replied, trying to sound sincere. We both gave Oscar-winning performances, and we both pretended not to know what was going on, which in my case wasn't too far from the truth. The only possible reason for such a change in mood. She clearly did not suddenly remember her love for me. She knew about the money and wanted to know where it was. Would you like an omelet and orange juice for breakfast? Okay, we were deep in the twilight zone at that point. Oh, that would be so sweet, honey, I replied, trying to sound loving and not too confused. Everything continued in the same vein, which turned out to be more stressful for me than the usual nagging or even possible murderers waiting for me in the supermarket. Later, when I was sitting in front of the TV, she surprised me again by trying to sit right next to me. It took a lot of effort not to recoil. I was no longer used to close contact with other people. I didn't know how to handle the situation. It was easier with nagging to be indifferent. This was our usual modus operandi. Being nice took a lot more work, but I tried. I really tried. Michael, she began and immediately stopped, clearly struggling to find the right words. I know things haven't been easy between us lately. Don't think it was all your fault. I just looked at her, nodding slightly. She looked compassionate, caring, like Doris from way back when. We started off so well, and I really thought you were the one, she continued. Something went wrong along the way, and I don't even know what. Work, worries, everyday life, I don't know. I nodded again in agreement. Unfortunately, yes, I feel the same way. I never wanted us to break up. Don't think that I didn't love you. I noticed the time passed. I just don't see any way to escape this endless repetition. It's worn me out, it's changed me, and it's changed you too. I thought about it for a while and appreciated that she gave me the time to do it. Unfortunately, my thoughts did not lead to any result. Do you think this can be saved? I finally asked, not knowing if I really wanted this. No, she said, sounding genuinely sad. It's too late for that. We can still live together, and we can make things better. We can try to be nicer. But that burning love won't come back. It was tough, but maybe she was right. Could you do that? Continue to live with me without love? Please don't think that I don't love you. I can easily imagine living with you for a while longer. I think I'm looking for a break, a way to escape this endless repetition. I just wish we could find that way. Together. You just don't love me anymore, do you? Not anymore, no. I won't apologize because I'm sure you feel the same. I nodded and we just sat there, looking at the TV, not seeing anything. It was a good moment. We felt close again for the first time in forever, both knowing it was probably the last time. I still didn't know if she knew anything about money, but at that moment I suspected that she didn't. I hoped she wasn't so cold and calculating and was just going through an unusual phase. Maybe she too felt that we had come to an end, and this was her way of saying goodbye. Anyway, she started massaging my neck, which was her signal that she was ready for sex years ago. The whole conversation was amazing, but it really baffled me. I didn't love her anymore, she didn't love me anymore, and we got used to the idea of breaking up. Was sex really the best idea at the time? No, he wasn't, but who cared? I wanted it, and so did she. We got up from the sofa, since any form of intimacy outside the bedroom had always been unthinkable for her. I followed her there and began to doubt whether I could stay in the mood. In the bedroom, the first thing she did was turn off the light. Sighing, I remembered that seeing her naked body, even during sex, had always been something of a taboo. My mood was almost ruined by that moment. In the semi-darkness, I listened to her undress and decided to do the same, mainly to avoid making the situation even more awkward. A few seconds later, I felt her naked body next to mine. Any doubts about my mood left my head immediately. I still desired her on some level. The feeling of her bare skin reminded me painfully of the past, of the burning need we once felt for each other. My old, long-buried feelings flared up again, and I kissed her wherever I could get her. We were soon entwined on the bed, kissing passionately and moaning. Yes, she still had feelings for me too. No one could be that good an actor. 
My old Doris was still out there somewhere, well guarded by the new Doris. I wanted to kiss her everywhere, smell her, taste her, even if it was the last time. I tried to enjoy everything I could, but she stopped me, guiding me upstairs. No kisses below the belt, I remembered and obeyed, suppressing disappointment. We got lost in the moment, forgetting about everything around us, enjoying each other. It was like a time machine taking us back to happier times. Satiated and happy, we enjoyed the moment, and I remained where I was. I kissed her again, absorbing her taste and smell after sex. It was an unexpected intimate moment. We both enjoyed it, trying to forget that this would be our last time. I hated that damn car service. It was dark. Yes, there were windows, but the last time they were clean was when they were new many decades ago. Now they were just a slightly lighter brown than the walls. The room was filled with all sorts of junk, mostly tires and calendars with naked women. There were objects that I could not identify, perhaps no one could. Entering there was like entering a sacred sanctuary. It wasn't strictly prohibited, but I certainly wasn't welcome there. I never realized how many people work there. They appeared and disappeared all the time, and I was almost sure that there were more than four and less than ten. It didn't help that they all looked pretty much the same. Short hair, lots of muscles and tattoos. All that was missing were bars on the windows, and it would look exactly like a maximum security prison. There was only one car lift and one tire mounting machine. I had no idea why so many people worked there or what they did all day, but I suspected that most of it was not entirely legal. Everything looked cheap and worn out. There was no way all these guys were making an honest living. The backyard was expansive and looked like a forested car park. Some cars looked like they hadn't moved since the Stone Age. Others had changed all the time. There were no price tags or other signs that they were for sale. Many looked too expensive for such an abandoned place. I stuck to my usual, no questions asked policy. When I walked into the store, I found Vinny standing with two other guys at the tire fitting machine. As usual, no one seemed to care or care about this fact. Making money through manual labor did not seem to be a top priority. As usual, everyone completely ignored my presence. I stood in the middle of the store like a brainless idiot. God, I hated these dominance games. Finally, Doris came in behind me and Vinny showed interest in her. As usual, he was focused on her cleavage. She never seemed to mind and always dressed accordingly. I never complained as we usually only saw him when we needed something from him, and I understood why she did that. After half an hour of being ignored or being yelled at rudely, I was finally able to tackle the damn Maeda. As expected, no one helped me, not even Doris, but I could at least use the lift and tools. My wife was busy talking to the guys in Vinny's office. Miraculously, their number increased from three to four, and I had no idea where the extra guy came from or which one it was. The office was separated from the store by glass. I suspected that if I removed the glass now, the dirt itself would still do the job. The density of photos of naked women was even higher there, and with five people the place was absolutely crowded. They were talking animatedly until they suddenly fell silent and everyone turned to look at me. Cold shivers ran down my spine. Crap. Money. They somehow found out about the money. I knew they were all criminals in some way, so why did I even come here? These guys had a sixth sense for these things. Suddenly, they started talking again, but now from time to time they glanced in my direction. Right now, I would prefer their previous disdain. I continued working on the damn car, trying to act like nothing was happening. Nice car. I jumped in surprise and cut my hand on the hose clamp. There was a guy standing behind me. How the hell did such a big, muscular man manage to sneak up on me so unnoticed? His smile revealed several gold teeth and distorted the huge scar that crossed his mouth. Above his eyebrow was a tattoo of a large piece of barbed wire. In my opinion, it was as unattractive as the huge spider tattoo on his bare stomach or the tears under both eyes. The guy was almost two meters tall. All his fat seemed to be stored in his belly, the rest was pure muscle. Overall, he looked intimidating. To any alien who happened to land right in this store, 
we would appear to be different species. What? I croaked, hating how scared I sounded. Nice car, he repeated patiently, as if he was used to talking to idiots. Why should he talk about the car? She wasn't nice. It was just a broken down old Maeda worth less than one of his teeth. Oh, thanks. He looked satisfied that he had finally gotten through to the idiot. Trouble with the gearbox? Okay, I was sure he knew about my money. It cannot be that he was in any way interested in my problem with the gearbox. Feeling trapped by these questions, I could only nod silently. You're not a talkative person, right? Oh God, he couldn't have been clearer. If I don't want to talk, he will force me. He was clearly some kind of expert in pain and communication. Um, sorry. I shrugged to buy some time. I'm stuck with this bolt. Try to heat it up, buddy. With that, he slapped me on the back, which made me flinch, and left the store. What the hell just happened? I turned towards the office and saw Doris pointing at me as they all laughed. Was it because I was embarrassed, or because they were already dividing my money? Wait, did I just call it my money? Seriously? I have to remind myself that my main goal is still to get rid of them without dying in the process. After a while, Doris joined me in the car, but avoided touching any tools. When will you finish? The new Doris was back in action. Impatient, ungrateful, demanding. It's like last night never happened. Doris, I'm just a vending machine technician. No one here is offering to help me, and I really don't know how to do it at all. Try to finish by tonight, okay? I want to go to Monica's for brunch tomorrow morning. Wow, even for Doris, this was a rare form. What about helping me? Of course, she simply ignored this absurd idea. You know, Vinny told me about a way to make money. Do you remember that beautiful turquoise suitcase that I gave you? So, someone is looking for the same one and is ready to patch please for the tip. My blood froze instantly, and I was sure that Doris noticed it. What? Why would anyone pay for such a... I almost said, ugly thing, but that wouldn't be smart for a suitcase like this. I don't know, and maybe it's best not to ask too many questions, if you know what I mean. There seems to be some confusion at the airport. Are you sure you got the right one? There can't be too many of those around. Of course. My clothes and tools were in it, so it had to be mine. Got it. Tell me, where is he even now? I couldn't find him this morning. Hell, she's already started looking for money, the game is truly over. The only question is whether she has already sold my life. In my trunk. She nodded approvingly and smiled before adding. I'm glad to hear it, darling. I'm glad to hear it, she repeated, sweet as honey. It just seems like the other one contained tools just like what a vending machine technician would need. Damn, I was toast. She knew exactly what was happening. It was fast. I expected to be found sooner or later, but not so soon, and not by my own wife. Out of curiosity, how much are they willing to pay, dear? How much was my life worth? Two hundred thousand, dear? That's a lot of money. Damn it! She's already sold my life. I was sure of it. Two hundred was too much for Doris to refuse. So what do we do now, Doris? How do we solve this? We don't have to do anything, honey. Please fix it by tonight, okay? This, a suitcase, a car, or my miserable life? A car, dear. A car. Of course, dear. With that, she just turned around and left me to die. We arrived in my car, and I still had the key, so I didn't know who would drive it home. I was still in shock. Not knowing what else to do, I looked around and realized that I was completely alone. When did it happen? Okay, time to sum it up. First of all, forget about the gearbox. This thought made me happy. Secondly, should I go to the police? Not an option. They either won't believe me, won't be able to protect me, or will arrest me on common grounds. What else could I do? My only advantage was money. I had to use them to disappear, and I had to do it quickly. How can a person hide? I had no idea. I was just a vending machine technician. Still, it seemed like the only option. What about Doris? I still wasn't sure if she had betrayed me. 
Could I really leave her alone and without money? What if she didn't tell Vinny? Just for my own peace of mind, I had to find out without dying in the process. Carefully, I sneaked out of the store through the roll-up gate. There was no one in sight. The botanical parking lot in the back seemed empty. Why did they leave so quickly? To take a weapon. It's unlikely I was no match for them, even unarmed. To get instructions from the boss, it was possible. They probably didn't discuss such things over the phone, and they certainly weren't somewhere at the top of the hierarchy. I vaguely heard my wife squealing in the distance. I couldn't contain my curiosity and sneaked behind the old school bus, which more or less hid me as I made my way to the small, run-down trailer that Vinny seemed to live in. I knew Vinny had money, so the trailer was either an understatement, a cover-up, or just plain ignorance. The thing was in terrible condition. My guess was that it was once white or beige. This assumption was not based on its current condition, but on my experience that the damn things were always either white or beige. He was now somewhere between green and brown and generally seemed in the process of returning to nature. The windows were tinted in an 80s brown style. It would be impossible to look inside if one of them were not open. I hated Vinny. The trailer was disgusting. I didn't care about my wife anymore. Why did I even sneak up to this window to look at the combination of all three? Did I really need to know this? Would this change anything? Did I wait until I answered these important questions? No. Driven by morbid curiosity, I just went ahead and looked inside. My first thought was how well the thick gold chain on his massive, hairy chest matched the 80s trailer. He had my wife growling as if dubbing an old adult film. He constantly looked at her expectantly, as if he was waiting for some kind of reaction. Doris had never been really active during sex, but this was too much. She looked around, not focusing on anything in particular, since there wasn't really anything to look at in that damn trailer. This obviously included Vinny. She even checked her nails at one point, which only turned him on more. The whole trailer was shaking. It must have hurt, but she tried to remain indifferent. It was their game, I realized, and they had been perfecting it for a long time. He liked it when his partner was indifferent and ignored him. He wanted to be humiliated during sex. I had no idea what went wrong in his life to make him work like that, but at that moment I almost felt sorry for him. His sweat dripped onto her chest. She ignored it, like all his efforts. It wasn't until I turned away and walked back into the store as quickly as possible that I heard him roar like a bear, announcing to the world what a sick puppy he was. Okay, Doris cheated, and she clearly did it often enough to perfect their sad version of sex. She always liked bad boys, especially Vinny. It was almost insulting. I was of average build, with no illusions about exceptional intelligence, and certainly not a fighter. However, sometimes people assured me that I looked very good. Doris was never one of them, but I could at least assume that I wasn't terribly ugly. What did she see in Vinny? It was almost absurd. His face had never been beautiful, and his numerous battle markings did not add to his character. They only made him uglier. He was almost bald, had a lot of ugly scars, even more ugly tattoos, and his whole face was somehow distorted. On the other hand, he was huge, muscular, and a skilled fighter. He was the complete opposite of me, so her choice as my replacement was a little unsettling. Sex was clearly physically unsatisfying for her, so I had to assume she was enjoying the hidden power play. She could humiliate and dominate this dangerous man, or was it all just a financial consideration? I didn't know and realized that this was absolutely normal. Either way, she could have it. They seemed to be happy with each other in their own unique way. Time to leave forever. I decided to leave the Mayata and its broken transmission in its new home, Vinny's garage. It's not my problem anymore. I briefly wondered if Vinny could use heat to unscrew the damn bolt. However, this was not the most important issue at that moment. Staying alive was. Where could I hide? How could I get the money without getting killed? Are there really guys who sell new identities like that guy from Breaking Bad? How can I find them? Do I need a gun? I had few advantages, but one of them was my discreet car. I had an old Toyota Corolla that hadn't been washed in years. 
I doubted even Doris would recognize him. To her, it was just a pile of metal sitting in the driveway, but she never gave it a close look. Vinny probably didn't even know such cars existed. She was as inconspicuous as a car could be. I decided to buy a few supplies, hide my car behind a supermarket dumpster, calm down and wait until nightfall. The wait seemed endless, especially as I imagined Vinny and Doris frantically searching for my money as they tore apart our house. The sudden boredom also meant that I could no longer look away from some brutal facts. My life has been what experts call a lousy pile of horse shit. My life was in danger, and I didn't care that was a good indicator of the state of things. My wife had sex with her cousin in a junkyard, and I didn't really care either. Yes, my life was crap, and I had avoided this obvious fact for too long. Finally, I was going to do something about it, even though I was being pushed into action against my will. No matter how it ended, I definitely wasn't going to continue living the miserable life I had, and that was a big relief. I reflected on how life had kicked me and spoiled my dreams. Doris and I were once madly in love. She was completely different then, but I guess so was I. She was cheerful, caring, interested, full of life and optimism. I was ambitious, thoughtful, and loving. Where did it all go? It was a gradual, insidious change. I should have noticed this, but I didn't. Our love disappeared, little by little, unnoticed, and without regret, until one day, in one moment, I realized that we were dead. We were going through life, doing everyday activities, but we were dead. We never talked about it, but it seemed like each one blamed the other. As a result, we moved further away from each other, waiting for the first step, trying to punish the other for his absence. I escaped the tension by working more and more, even demanding to be sent on business trips as often as possible. I hated it, but I hated being home even more. She took revenge by perfecting her intolerable role as a bitch. This could have been her helpless attempt to get through to me, I realized. It didn't matter, it was too late to fix anything even then. After some time, sex began to be used as a weapon. She refused, I took revenge, not paying attention to it. The game progressed until we began to live like brother and sister. Then we became enemies. Money has become one of the main reasons for quarrels. She became more and more focused on them. At one point she insisted on staying home, probably to put more pressure on me. I reacted by choosing a career path that eliminated any chance of advancement. We were a completely spoiled couple. Someone should have written a book about us, although I suspect we weren't that unusual. Did I regret the loss of Doris? Strange, but no. I regretted the loss of our dreams, the life we could have lived, how we had squandered it all on petty power struggles. I didn't feel sorry for her as a person. Finally, it became dark outside, and I was freed from my unpleasant thoughts. I felt like a pervert, hiding behind a bush in the dark, watching the house. In this case, it was my own house, well, technically Vinny's house, and it was unlit. It could have been a trap or Doris was still enjoying the luxury of Vinny's trailer. After an hour, I decided that further observation would not bring new results. I could either go in or leave. The problem was that I had nowhere to go and no plan. I at least needed my damn money and a few personal items. That meant walking into the backyard and likely falling into whatever trap they could lay out. For a guy who had been contemplating suicide for years, I was surprisingly cowardly. Finally, I decided to just go through with it, but with the added trick of entering the house through the back door. I probably would never have fixed the squeaky door if it was just Doris' request just to spite her, but she annoyed me enough that I did it a few weeks ago. Now I thanked my foresight and the WD-40 as I could silently enter the house like a ghost. Well, I would have been able to if I hadn't stepped on one of Doris' Amazon packages that the delivery guy usually left right outside the usually unlocked back door. The bubble wrap burst, announcing my presence to anyone hiding to ambush me. However, everything remained quiet. I stood in the dark with my heart pounding, almost staining my pants. Nothing happened. Luckily, I knew the layout of the house and was able to get to the bedroom without further incident. My plan was to fumble around for a few spare items in the almost complete darkness and disappear before anyone realized what had happened. 
I found my gym bag, which had never been used for its intended purpose, and threw it on the bed. First I decided to feel my socks. Having tried to feel the position of the bag in the dark to put them inside, I instead felt what was clearly a leg. Surprised, I jumped back, knocking over the ugly floor lamp that Doris had bought just to annoy me. With my heart pounding, I waited for someone to come check what the noise was and kill me in the process. I really didn't expect to find a foot in my bed. Moreover, its owner did not react to the touch. Okay, time for my perfect stealth operation was over. I took my phone and turned on the flashlight. Doris. She was lying in bed, which in itself was not unusual. After all, it was her bed. She was naked, which was a little more unusual. She went to great lengths to hide her body from me for years, even the last time we had sex. It still looked good, but it didn't make me particularly want it. One reason is that she was dead. Now was absolutely not the time to think, but I still thought about our life together. I was sorry to see her dead, but I was not overcome with grief. I put off deciding whether I should feel guilty for my insensitivity when I heard someone coming up the stairs. Someone who didn't know where the creaking board was. Only Doris and I knew where she was, so that didn't give me any useful information. I turned off the flashlight and retreated to a corner, hoping that the darkness would hide me and give me at least some advantage. This has always worked in films. He just turned on the light and looked straight at me. Crap. It was the guy with the heated bolt from the auto repair shop. He looked at me surprisingly friendly. So did you loosen that bolt? No, I croaked. You're still not the most talkative, are you? What happened to Doris, I asked, not making any sense. I would have died within minutes, so why did I even need information about a woman I no longer cared about? It's just business, kid. It's always just business. The boss decides what needs to be done. And you do this. Sometimes, sometimes he does it himself, he said, nodding toward the bed. I noticed maybe the sheets were rumpled, which meant they were having their usual, joyless sex one last time before he ended their whirlwind romance forever. Her death also meant that she was no longer valuable to them, so it could be assumed that they had already received all the information she could give them so it was cheaper to kill her than to pay her. I asked, imitating movie heroes who receive important information from the villain before dying. Only they are always saved at the last minute, which in my case seemed unlikely. Right, like I said, it's just business. Okay, I croaked. What will happen now? More business, he replied, starting to move towards me. For some reason, he placed his gun on the table behind him. No muffler, and he probably didn't want to bother the neighbors. This was very prudent. Mrs. Anderson was quite fragile and easily worried. I wondered if Vinny was using a silenced gun when he shot Doris, or if he just didn't care. Nothing personal, he added, as if that justified everything. He calmly grabbed me by the neck, and I stood like a rabbit in front of a snake. As I felt increasing pressure on my neck, I realized that my arms were too short to reach it. They waved helplessly in the air as he calmly watched me die. He looked at me as if he liked me, even though we barely knew each other. As a final insult, the last thing I felt was that disgusting heavy snow globe that Doris had bought for a ridiculous amount of money. Once she found out how much I hated it, she decided to keep it on the windowsill, not just at Christmas, but all year round. I was already starting to lose consciousness when I grabbed it tighter and without thinking, I hit the guy in the head with the heated bolt. He seemed to have his arms bent at that moment, otherwise I would not have been able to reach his head. There was a thud, followed by my heavy breathing, and another thud as he fell to the floor. I enjoyed the simple and underrated luxury of being able to breathe for a few seconds. Death was becoming a popular activity in my bedroom, and I decided to leave before I joined the trend. I hurriedly continued packing which was greatly accelerated by the light that the guy with the heated bolt turned on. I quickly grabbed several documents that could be important and even took his gun. I'd never felt the need to own a gun before, but it seemed like a good idea when you were being hunted by a bandit, or whoever it was. After that, I did the obvious I calculated my position. I was a widower, I killed a man, 
I lost my entire life, and all my belongings fit into one large duffel bag. I felt good. I felt like all I needed at this point was the few million in cash I had. I suddenly panicked, realizing that I had not yet checked to see if they had found them. When I hid the money, the place seemed brilliant, but now it seemed idiotically obvious. I hurried out the back door, stepping on the damn parcel again, and quickly climbed up the huge tree using the remains of the steps someone had driven into it. Here he is. The turquoise monster had never looked as beautiful as he did at that moment. I loved this thing. I quickly opened it and checked that all the money was there before realizing that they could have replaced it with a bomb. Here I am again, the usual hopeless fool with my usual ugly turquoise suitcase. I stood on the street, looking at what had once been my home. Leaving should be easy. The place was rented, I didn't like anything inside, we didn't have kids and didn't have too many good memories. Inside what had once been my bedroom, my wife lay dead. We may have hated each other in the end, she tried to sell my life, she cheated on me with her ugly cousin. Still, this was the woman I once loved, with whom I wanted to share my life, with whom I shared my dreams. Something went wrong at some point, long before I received the damn money against my will. Something had gone off the rails, and leaving like that seemed like a huge failure. I was still wondering why Vinny didn't find the money. He either didn't have time to search thoroughly, or he was even stupider than me. It didn't matter. All that mattered was that I still had my money, my life, and my Corolla. Soon I started the powerful four-cylinder engine and smoothly drove off the street. Remembering the movies, I checked the rear mirror, making sure no one was following me. I thought briefly about the two bodies lying in my bedroom. I decided that this would be Vinny's problem. This was his home, and now it is his mess. I knew exactly where I wanted to escape from, but unfortunately I didn't know where. I decided to ride randomly until I lost interest and stayed where it would happen. South. I wanted to go south. I always hated the cold, and it got worse as I got older. I briefly considered quitting my job, but decided not to bother. I hated my boss almost as much as I hated my past life in general, including the cold. Perhaps this strange development was a good thing. I was almost dead, but this last adventure might be just what I needed. As usual, breakfast was a sad affair. Time and time again, the elderly innkeeper assured me that the establishment had once been some kind of international tourist destination. At that moment, there was nothing to suggest this. It was a rundown hotel, bordering on dilapidated, overlooking a lake that looked like an oversized brownish puddle. The main advantages were that they accepted cash, didn't ask questions, and were as remote as a hotel could be. Paying in cash was fine for me since I had enough of it and had no qualms about using it. There was no point in keeping the money intact, they still wanted me dead. I hid most of the cash in a new location in the woods and only carried a few thousand. There were only a few guests and I always wondered what they were doing here anyway. They were all men looked unhappy and left in the morning, returning in the evening. I had no idea what they were doing in between. I myself didn't know what to do with my time. Somehow, I imagined that running away from the mafia would be more exciting, stressful, and dangerous. Instead, I endlessly ran around the puddle and was bored the rest of the time. I always looked forward to meals, not because of their quality, but because they interrupted boredom. However, the hotel gave me a feeling of relative safety since I could immediately check on any new visitor. I knew all the guys who were staying there now, and they all seemed harmless. At that moment, I was ready to trade boredom for relative safety. I didn't miss Doris at all. On the contrary, her disappearance from my life was like a weight off my shoulders. I didn't even feel sorry for how she died. I briefly wondered if I should feel bad about my insensitivity, but remembering how she deceived me helped. I've been checking the news for information about her or anyone who might be the hot bolt guy, but, surprisingly, nothing appeared. It seemed like the mafia had somehow managed to sweep everything under the rug. I think it helped that the house we lived in belonged to Vinny. After a few weeks, I hated my new life almost as much as I hated my old one. Of course, her mood swings were unbearable, I hated my job and everything was monotonous as hell. 
but at least something was happening, even if it was just a broken vending machine. The hotel by the lake began to feel like a prison. Plus, people started asking questions. It was obvious that I was not a tourist, and some, including the innkeeper, began to show curiosity. So far I had managed to dodge their questions, but I felt the pressure growing. Because of this, I did not fall into my usual paranoia when new guests arrived. I was glad that they diverted some of the unwanted attention. The new guests were two guys who arrived together, soon followed by a single woman. The woman could be attractive if she made the effort, but she clearly chose not to. She wore a hoodie, jeans, and sneakers, all well-worn and showing a lack of funds. I felt a little sorry for her. She was clearly hiding from something or someone just like me. The guys caught my attention. They looked at me very briefly upon arrival, then immediately looked away. It was pretty obvious that they were checking me out, but they were trying to be subtle. They didn't succeed. They were either homosexuals or were looking for someone, most likely me. So this has begun, I thought. At least the leaden boredom was ready to end, although any excitement would probably involve my death. I briefly wondered if I would meet Doris in hell, and this prospect motivated me to stay alive. I immediately took action, namely, I went to my room and hid there. Of course, I kept fiddling with that damn gun, not expecting to stand a chance against two trained mafia killers. I waited for hours until lunch, but I couldn't hide and starve in my room. After a few days I was more or less calm again and was desperate enough to look forward to communicating with the innkeeper and staff. She was a good woman, just unbearably boring and a little fragile. I was surprised to see her serving lunch and clearing tables. I didn't expect her to do manual labor at her age. George is sick as hell today, she muttered. Even as she explained her situation, the stack of plates she was holding tilted dangerously in my direction, as if it had already decided to obey the call of gravity. I quickly stepped forward, steadying her. It wouldn't be so bad if Paulin hadn't quit to follow her ex-husband, she continued, not noticing that I was already carrying most of the plates. Finally, she released the stack completely to gesture with her hands, emphasizing her situation. It's so hard to find good workers these days. I tuned out because I already knew the rest of her speech. No work ethic, which meant no one was willing to work for a ridiculous amount of money. Her staff explained the situation from their point of view more than once. I just sighed and took the stack into the kitchen, where Chef Joe seemed under a lot of pressure. He seemed to consider me some kind of blessing. After years with Doris, it was nice. God, thank you for your help, Michael. The old hag is slower than my old Yugo when the engine was broken. Take this outside, okay? I really appreciate it. He pointed to several plates of what had once been hot food. I just shrugged, picked them up, and carried them outside. Why not? I worked as a waiter to earn some money many years ago. I was still bored, and honestly, it felt good to help. Of course, the two new guys chuckled as they made rude remarks. However, the woman in the hoodie was looking at me strangely. If I didn't know better, I would say that this look was almost adoring. Anyway, she smiled sweetly, and again I thought how beautiful she could be if she didn't try to hide it. Do you like it here? The guy asked, shamelessly looking at me. Could a hitman really be so impudent? On the other hand, what other reason would someone ask such a question? Um, yes, more or less, yes, I replied as casually as possible, pretending to be busy with a modest breakfast buffet. Is it true? What are you doing in this hole? He laughed, not paying attention to the indignant looks of the inn owner. I decided that he was either not a killer or a stupid killer, or this was a brilliant way to make me think he wasn't a killer. Installing equipment in a steel mill like Joe and me. No, not at the steel mill. I'm just, ah, enjoying the scenery. Well, it turned out that there was a steel mill nearby, which explained why anyone would stop here in the first place. He laughed out loud, as if it was the best joke he had ever heard. Scenery? Is there a landscape here? I relaxed. The guy was too loud and annoying to be a mafia hitman. But that other guy, he always looked at me too closely. He will need to be monitored. I opened the door to my room and was immediately pulled inside, 
taking me completely by surprise. My ass was on the bed before I knew what was happening. There were two guys in my room. This is what happened. Looking down two barrels at once, this was yet another event. And of course, I felt like a complete idiot for getting caught so easily. I watched all the men around me like a hawk, assessing potential threats. I didn't even notice these two. Crap. My money was relatively safe in its hiding place in the forest, but my life clearly was not. They wanted to know where the money was, and to me it seemed like a lose-lose situation. I was dead either way, the only thing left to decide was whether they would get the money and how painful my death would be. Having nothing to lose, I jumped up and tried to shoot one of them down. He waved me off easily and threw me back onto the bed. Touching him was like wrestling with a stone and brought just as much pleasure. Listen, man, I don't care. Either you tell us where the money is, or I'll kill you right there. These are my orders from Vinny, and I really don't care about the outcome. Tradition probably required me to deny that I had money, but I knew it was useless. Game over. I felt amazingly calm. Okay, it looks like I'm going to die soon anyway. The question is whether Vinny will become richer after this or not. Why should I give him money? He looked puzzled for a moment, but quickly regained his stupidity. Really, man, I don't care. Either you give us the money, or I'll kill you right now. With these words, he calmly grabbed a pillow to place on my face. Stop, that doesn't make sense. The movies say he'll be willing to talk about it. Wait, wait, you don't need money. The rest was muffled by the pillow. Damn, he really didn't care. He just had to shoot me and be done with it. Damn, why did Vinny send these idiots? They were too stupid, even for simple logic. I felt a slight pressure on the other side of the pillow and realized it was a gun pressed into it. Damn, I was really going to die. I tried unsuccessfully to convince myself that this was normal and my life was crap anyway. Now that it was about to happen, the thought of death suddenly didn't seem so desirable. They say that before you die, your whole life flashes before your eyes, and I really didn't want to see that crap again. I barely heard the sound of two muffled shots and thought, that's it, I was killed. Vinny's idiots also seemed to struggle with logic. The guy's weight seemed to fall off of me to the side, which confused me even more. I still didn't dare touch the pillow until it was pulled from my face woman in a sweatshirt. What the hell is she doing here? Why was she holding a pistol with a silencer? Why are the boys dead? Why did she suddenly seem so damn hot and professional? What was my brilliant conclusion from all these questions? I'm sorry, what? She retorted. It seemed to me that she was enjoying it and was ready to continue for some time. I mean, then again, my eloquence must have blinded her. Good to know. She couldn't hide her smile completely. What? You already said it, Einstein. What's going on here? Ah, finally, a complete sentence. Fair question. They are dead and you are alive. Do you have an opinion on this? How could she joke in such a situation? I have. It would be sad if it were the other way around. See? That's why I'm here. Have you done something like this before? You mean saving aimless fools? I had to laugh, which seemed a little inappropriate given the seriousness of the situation. I felt the adrenaline go away and my muscles gradually relaxed. No, I mean, did you kill two guys who were about to execute an eloquent, innocent man? Now it was her turn to laugh. My dear, you are neither eloquent nor innocent. Maybe, but still, why did you save me? This is my job she said, and pulled out a badge that looked official. The most noticeable features were the three capital letters F, B, and I. Wow, the government saved me. Why worry? They need a vending machine technician for some secret government job. Why is saving me your job? I asked myself this over and over again. Why couldn't I learn to be useful? For example, a plumber, or a wood carver, a pilot, teacher, anyone, I wouldn't have to kill idiots to save other idiots. I laughed again. No, I mean, why save me? Oh, I could tell you, but then I would have to kill you. That wouldn't make sense, would it? Probably not, 
and I'd rather not die today. Okay, buddy, you need to help me. We need to clean up this mess. How? I mean, it's terrible. Don't think too hard. We just need to move it to a more suitable location, like a nice landfill. Okay, tell me what to do, I replied, wondering why a government agent would have to clean up such a mess. Can't they just call someone who does it? You have that ugly old Corolla, right? Hey, how is this possible? She just laughed, understanding what I was talking about. Nobody ever noticed my car. I'm a mutant. I can see invisible cars. And invisible guys, it seems. Oh, you are far from invisible, believe me. You just don't notice how the women around you look at you. You are very good looking, but not vain. I like that in a guy, okay? Seriously? Doris convinced me that I was overall pretty mediocre. Um, I began, unsure how to respond to a compliment from an attractive woman. Yes, I have this old Corolla. What do we need to do? We need plastic film, brushes, and detergent. We need to steal a set of bedding from hotel services to replace this. Okay, let's go. It was nice to have something to do after weeks of waiting. We hung a Do Not Disturb sign on the door and went on a surprisingly fun shopping spree. I wondered how we were going to get them out of the room. We need to do this soon. The hotel service will at some point ignore our sign. True, but they could shoot you later, even with a fake FBI badge. She couldn't hold back her laughter any longer. I decided that I liked it when she laughed. I don't think you can fool me, right? It's a shame. This badge is a masterful fake and cost me five bucks in the gift shop. We should have spent it on cheap glasses. Handsome guy, my ass. It's up to me to decide. I already know that you don't really like yourself, but I don't agree with that. This silenced me for a while. Is she serious or just playing with me? A woman like her couldn't really be interested, right? Maybe she just needs my help in disposing of these idiots. No, for some reason I trusted her. A few hours later the room was spotless. I think this was now the cleanest room in the entire hotel, and I hoped that the hotel service would not notice this. Hey, it's too heavy. Should we just throw him down the stairs? She seemed to consider this for a few seconds. His head will hit the steps and wake everyone up. I can hold his head. Okay, let's try it. I found myself in a strange situation, holding the head of the dead guy who tried to kill me earlier while his body was dragged down the stairs by the beautiful woman who saved my life. A few weeks ago, these things weren't part of my daily life, but I really liked the new me. I could do without these near-death experiences. It turned out that the average mafia killer was too big for the trunk of a Corolla. Somehow, the Toyota dealership hid this important advice for consumers. We had to fold down the back seats, but the film tore as we tried to get him in there in the most undignified manner. It seems like everything went well, I concluded, slamming the lid. We both laughed. Yeah, we were pretty smooth. Let's get rid of it and try better with the second one. Practice makes perfect. By five in the morning, we both collapsed on my bed, dead tired. I was too exhausted to be surprised to find her head on my shoulder. We just fell asleep instantly. That night, I learned that crime can be hard work. As always lately, when I had nothing else to do, I stared at her. It didn't matter what she was doing, which at that time was nothing but sunbathing. Well, not quite the whole body, unfortunately, since we were again at the hotel pool. She convinced me to move to a better place, and since I was tired of this damned lake, a wretched hotel, and monotonous conversations with the hostess, I did not really resist. She seemed pretty carefree about everything, and a little of that rubbed off on me. When I wasn't too busy enjoying the view, which by the way she never minded, I kept asking myself who she was and why she helped me in the first place. However, I never dared to voice these concerns, I think I was afraid of answering or scaring her off with questions. Honestly, I enjoyed my time with her too much to rock the boat. Why did you save me? I suddenly blurted out, interrupting my own thoughts about not asking questions. If I answer this, will you tell me why they wanted to kill you? I have no idea. I have no idea why I saved you then. 
She smiled sweetly, and again I had the feeling that she knew everything about me and was just playing with me. Did she just like to play with me before killing me? Why then save me in a hotel room? She wanted to gain my trust so that I would tell her where the money was hidden, which was still lying in its old hiding place. How could she even know about money? She would know about them if she were a mafia hitman. It didn't make sense. Why then kill your colleagues? Nothing about her made sense, but she had a great sense of humor, was hot as hell, and a pleasure to be around. And of course, there was that smile. The sex was good. God, sex with Danny was good. He's always been like this. Sometimes wild, sometimes slow and loving, sometimes fun and experimental. It was on a level that I had never experienced before. She looked at me with this strangely intense look, as if she really liked what she saw. Can't blame her since I probably looked at her the same way. I just couldn't get enough of her. I couldn't imagine life without her. I guess I'll have to find out someday, but I was willing to put that day aside for the indefinite future. The sex was amazing, the love was clearly real, but everything else was uncertain. I think I looked pretty happy. Yes, it's the same for me. I've never felt anything like this before, she told me after watching me for a while. Is it true? Answered incorrectly, and I received a half-love kick to the ribs. What do you think? Why do I do this all the time? For your information, mister, my job has basically turned me into a loner. I may have even had less sex than you, buddy. I highly doubt it. What kind of job do you even have? Rescuing brainless American vending machine technicians for the Uzbek government. This is the deal they made with the Pope to appease Greenpeace. We both had to snort. You must have been very busy. Sometimes. And you? I'm a brainless American vending machine technician who needed to be saved. I know that, smart guy. Why did you even need to be saved? Time travelers are trying to kill me over vending machine maintenance, which I screw up in the future, ultimately leading to World War Roman III. Ah, got it. The usual story. These conversations were fun, but I was also tired of avoiding this huge elephant in the middle of the room. If our relationship was to have a chance, we needed to be honest. The problem is that I just didn't dare. Move in with me, she suddenly said. What? Hell, she's already mockingly called me what man. I had to get rid of this. Is it true? I have a big house? I would. She surprised me by blushing like a schoolgirl. Forget. No, no. It's an honor for me. Do you trust me to invite you? Yes, she answered shyly. Oh my God. Of course, I would love to. One evening we sat cuddling by the fireplace. It was one of those perfect moments. She looked into my eyes for what seemed like hours. I wish I could diffuse the situation by looking away, but I just couldn't. Taking my eyes off her was always a challenge, and when she looked at me like that, it was impossible. I decided that I didn't want to turn my back on her after all. Okay, she said simply, as if that explained everything. I felt like she had made an important decision but I had no idea what it meant. Fine, I asked again, hoping that she had not decided to kill me. Okay, she confirmed. Fine. You are Michael Wilson. I know. Hey, wait. How did she know my last name? I don't remember ever mentioning this. I'm glad you know. I'm Danny Averson. This is my real name. Cool. Michael Wilson is also real. I know. This was one of the weirdest conversations I've ever had, and I've had a lot of them lately. According to the rules, you should be dead by now. I know. You've had a lot of bad luck, from choosing your wife, to traveling with that disgusting suitcase, to ending up with three million dollars in gangster money you never wanted. I was too shocked to answer. She knew everything all the time. You are also completely ignorant. You couldn't disappear properly, even with a suitcase full of unmarked cash. For a long time you did not notice that your wife was cheating. You couldn't even hide the location of your money from me. Wait, you know. Of course I know. One of us has to be smart, right? Either way, you're lucky that you're sweet, charming, and damn attractive, 
otherwise I wouldn't have chosen you as my retirement companion. Wait, what? You heard correctly. You don't even have to worry about your damn money. I have a lot more than you. This suitcase mix-up turned out to be the best thing that happened to you in a long time. Okay, this is already funny. You better shut up now, because this confusion was what brought us together. If you know what's good for you, don't deny it. Okay, I admit that this is a clear advantage. But none of this is worth much if we both get killed. This won't happen. You are now in the hands of a professional. Who the hell are you, Danny? Some kind of mafia hitman? I hoped she wouldn't be offended, but she just shrugged it off. Not really, although it was a tempting career option for a while. The best way to describe my job would be as a skip tracer. I find people who don't want to be found. And then you kill them. No, usually not. I only killed in self-defense if it was unavoidable. There are specialists for this kind of work. Crap. She was looking for people for the mafia and had no problem finding me. Okay, so what about the specialist waiting for me now? No, I didn't report you. I had been wanting to retire for a long time and was looking for an unhappy guy to share my pension with. I'm sorry, but I chose you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I put a spell on you. I was delighted, but tried not to show it too clearly. Instead, I pretended to consider her proposal. So you're telling us to enjoy the money we have, stay happy, fall more in love, and just enjoy life in general. Yes, and don't forget about a lot of sex and me, who will protect you. Sounds like a deal. Hum, I guess that sounds better than getting killed by Vinny. But just a little better, right? I stopped the banter with a long kiss. So you accept, Michael? Of course, I would be the greatest idiot if I refused this offer. No, don't say that, I added as she raised her finger to say something. But still, aren't you too optimistic about our chances against the whole mafia? The whole mafia, she snorted, as if, yes, there are several large organizations, but most of them are just local semi-speculators doing shady business together. In this case, it's Vinny trying to expand his business from buying stolen goods and junk cars to drugs. He borrowed your three million from Fat Alberto, which poses a problem for him if he doesn't pay it back. Vinny doesn't have some kind of cartel. He always only had a few people at his best. I don't know how many are left, as he seems to be having cash flow problems. He couldn't even give me an advance, which is why I was delayed in reporting on you in the first place. I don't know how many other people he has when he can't pay them. Their loyalty is usually strictly based on money. Anyway, it's funny how it all started. Your loving, cheating wife Doris thought it was funny to buy the same ugly suitcase twice and give one to her lover and the other to her husband. Of course, she didn't know that this little joke would lead to her own death. Wow, was all I could say. It's interesting, but also a little scary. Why? You know so much about me, much more than I knew about myself. What is my zodiac sign? Scorpio, which is good, because otherwise I would have to kill you. We both laughed. Okay, you were wrong about that, but it's still scary. You know so much about me, but I know nothing about you. Yes, you are a little at my mercy. It's cool. I can live with it. Mercy, damn it, I said picking her up and carrying her into the bedroom as she giggled happily. Well, in a metaphorical sense, she added before I completely shut her up. Well, not completely, but it was quite a while before either of us felt like speaking again. Seriously, what do you want to know? She resumed our conversation after it was interrupted by another fantastic sex. For example, your age, your story. My, don't you know anything? Never ask a lady her age which in this case is 32. Lady, as if, a mercenary for the mafia, I would say, corrupted by my irresistible charm. Yes, a mercenary, but not just for criminals. I was hired not only by people like Vinny, but also by corporations, wives looking for ex-husbands who forgot to pay child support, or even by the authorities, she replied after a loving blow to my ribs. 
You shouldn't even mention the Mafia when we talk about him. He's just a petty criminal, albeit a dangerous one. Glad to hear that. I'm dangerous too. I won't say it will be easy, but I think we can do it, she said, suddenly opening up and sounding very serious and a little worried. We can handle it. I'm sure we can handle it, I tried to convince both of us. A few days later, Danny returned to the topic. This situation needs to be resolved one way or another. I won't run from these bastards my whole life and end up caught off guard. We need to fight them, and we need to do it on our own soil. Don't know. I'm just a sales technician. Her lips pursed and her eyes flashed when she interrupted me. Yes, yes, yes. Vending machine technician. Keep hiding behind that title. Do you know what you mean when you say that? I'm a loser, and this is my excuse in case I screw it up again. You refuse to see yourself as a winner. Doris ruined everything. She was supposed to pull you out of your misery, lift you up, give you confidence. Instead, she destroyed you, and then she was unhappy with the result. You, on the other hand, feel comfortable in this role. This means you don't have to be ambitious, brave, or creative. You can stay on the couch while your life passes you by. To say I was shocked would be an understatement. I thought we were doing well. It really hurt to hear what she really thought of me, especially because it was absolutely true. I, I started, but immediately lost my breath. But I'm not Doris. It doesn't matter if she took away your confidence or if you never had it. She could have a great guy around if she saw your potential. You're damn good looking, caring and really sweet, and I can fix the rest. I laughed out loud. She was right. It was obvious as hell. I was a lazy loser. When things happened in my life, others controlled them. Doris, Vinny, and now Danny. So you want me to stand up to the people manipulating me? Damn it. From now on, I am the only one who will manipulate you. She laughed and kissed me on the lips. We will be equal, so I ask you if we will fight them so that we can live without their threat. Okay, so we'll meet them here at your house. That would be my voice. It's secluded, and we might as well prepare for it. Okay, cameras, traps, sniper rifles. This is the right way, dear. Okay, agree, let's do this together. Okay, she got her way, but she was an expert. The main thing was that they asked me for my opinion. I think I'll like it. How do we get them here? No problem. I know how to discreetly let them know our location when the time comes. They're here, she whispered, still shaking my shoulder. What? Who? I replied, still stunned that I had been rudely torn from a very pleasant dream. What do you think? Milkman. What? Oh, sorry. One of the motion detectors? Yes, at the main gate. I briefly wondered how I had managed to miss the sound of the alarm. They don't really care about subtlety. Okay, let's check the cameras. I was fully awake by this time, but still wanted my sleep back. Damn, this was serious. Either we or they would be dead by morning, and the outcome depended only on how good we were. We were well prepared, but there was one big flaw in our strategy. One person on our team was just a vending machine technician. Okay, I shouldn't have thought that way anymore, but it was still true. Danny had quite a large property, and her home was as secure as a normal home could be. She had eight CCTV cameras outside the house anyway. We took the time to install seven more, each with individual infrared lamps. In most cases, we installed them where we already had electricity. This meant that the entire area was not completely covered. When we woke up the computer, we got a good idea of what was going on. They decided to just use the main gate. This was reasonable, as otherwise the area was completely inaccessible. They jumped over the gate, probably thinking it was mined. They were right about this, but we installed additional light barriers that triggered the alarm. Thanks to the infrared lamps, the camera image was crystal clear. We saw two guys armed to the teeth, but without night vision goggles. One of them was clearly Vinny, but I didn't know the other. It's Fat Alberto himself, Danny informed me. He's the one Vinny took the money from. What I saw on the monitor looked like a guy who had just arrived from a fitness convention. 
How the hell did he get that nickname? I have no idea. Some say he's ex-Special Forces or something like that, but I'm not sure. I think he was always a petty gangster. However, everyone agrees that he is extremely dangerous and ruthless. Perhaps he was trained by people who know what they are doing. If he's funding the operation, what is he doing here? Oh, he's definitely a practical guy and rarely relies on anyone else to get his job done. I'm not surprised to see him. Meanwhile, they walked out of the camera frame. We still had plenty of time before they got home. Okay, what now? Plan A? She snorted. Smart ass. As if we had more than one. So yeah, we go with plan A. We see what they want to do, and we try to stay alive. Our plan was a little more detailed, but not much. The two of us will never be able to block all the ways they can reach us. We'll just have to continue to watch them and respond as best we can. We played out many scenarios, but agreed that reality probably wouldn't follow any of them. The first deviation was that there were only two of them. Why didn't they bring cannon fodder? I asked Danny. I am not sure. I'm a little surprised, too. I was also surprised that Fat Al was able to raise three million. Perhaps this was all he had, or he borrowed it himself. I guess they don't have any more cash for people. They surprised us by following the dirt road straight from the gate to the house. We more or less covered this route with cameras and other equipment because it was convenient to install them there. We really didn't expect them to be so straightforward. Either way, it gave us camera coverage again within a few minutes. Here they are, I exclaimed completely unnecessarily. Yeah, don't tell me, she snorted. Wait, they can't just go straight to, I started, but was rudely interrupted by reality. Al stepped into the hole I dug earlier. I really didn't expect these traps to be useful. The area was huge, and I lost interest in digging after only twelve holes. Hitting one was akin to winning some kind of negative lottery. They did, Danny commented dryly. Damn, this must hurt. I sincerely sympathized with the guy. He may have come here to kill me, but I still winced, imagining what had just happened to his leg. I once watched a documentary about Viet Cong traps. One of them was some kind of funnel with spikes sloping down. That's what kept his leg there, in a very painful way. Do you really feel for this guy? No, of course not. But still, God, this must be terrible. She suddenly kissed me, temporarily blocking the camera view. What is this for? For that you are such a sweet and caring guy. He deserved it, but you still feel for him. Hey, you even built this trap. Yeah, that was one time the maintenance tech came in handy, right? I'm really good at welding. We heard Al scream from afar, even without microphones. Vinny calmly turned around as the camera showed Al apparently begging for help. Vinny watched the scene but did nothing. He appreciates Al's usefulness, Danny noted. You don't think. I was rudely interrupted by reality again. Vinny approached Al from behind and shot him in the neck. Al went limp forward like a wet rag, and I felt a little sick. It's pretty easy so far, Danny commented succinctly. Hey, don't be a coward now. Would you feel better if you killed him yourself? No, of course not. You're right, Vinny did us a favor. But why did he do this? Al was useless. Vinny just got rid of having to pay back three million. Speaking of Vinny, she added, things are going to start getting interesting now. He's actually pretty good, and that's when we should think about starting the fight for our lives. You've done this before, right? I've killed people before, but never in a situation like this. Vinny is much more experienced at this, I'm afraid. It's time to take our positions. Vinny disappeared from the camera frame again, and we could not find him on other cameras. Crap. The moon was full, so he could probably move around without problems but I didn't expect him to notice the cameras. Maybe it was just bad luck. At least the house itself was completely covered, and the forest around it was brightly lit. Damn, I can't find him, Danny said, a little too panicked to calm my nerves. She was still switching cameras, but he had disappeared from the face of the earth. Okay, that's enough. We need to take our positions, she added. He will be here any moment. 
take your rifle and try to find him. We took our positions in opposite corners of the house, each with a rifle and a pistol, scanning the forest. I stared until my eyes nearly popped out of my head, but I still didn't see the slightest movement. We trained for this situation, but when it happened, the day was bright and sunny and everything seemed pretty simple. Now it was dark, scary, and someone had already died. It was damn serious. Plus, the death wish I sometimes had when I was married to Doris has completely disappeared since I met Danny. I really wanted us both to live. The loud explosion shocked me to death. Debris flew down the corridor, coming from the kitchen. Damn, he used some kind of grenade. I shouldn't have locked the front door. The silence that followed was deafening, and the darkness was absolute. The explosion appears to have knocked out the power supply. Crap. We didn't expect this, or we would have bought night vision goggles. I stared into the darkness with my eyes wide open and tried to listen to every little sound. Nothing. Then the shot shocked me, followed by another. I had no idea who shot who. The question was interesting enough to make me move my ass towards the kitchen where Danny was. The shooting stopped, but there was clearly some kind of struggle going on. My first instinct was to stay away, but the woman I loved was in trouble. I needed to help her. I needed to stand up and fight for her. I heard the typical impacts of soft bodies hitting something hard. I just hoped it was Danny who threw the punches. Finally, I stumbled into the kitchen and saw almost nothing. Moving shadows, unclear who is who, and again those damn disgusting blows. I was hoping it was Danny who was putting them on, but I had my doubts. I could clearly hear her moans now, and they didn't sound happy. I longed for some light and wondered how they could even fight in almost complete darkness. Another blow, and now it was clearly her cry of pain. I really needed to get the light. Stop. There was a flashlight in the kitchen, shelves near the entrance. This is where I was. Not believing my luck, I felt for a sure metal tube. Success. Now I had a flashlight in one hand and a loaded pistol in the other. Feeling confident, I turned on the flashlight and saw Danny lying on the floor, her arm raised to protect herself from the blows. She was badly beaten and clearly defeated. Vinny stood over her, holding a piece of wood above his head, preparing to deliver the finishing blow. Drop it, was all I had time to say before the tree flew in my direction. He was fast, I had to give him credit. Without thinking, I ducked away from him and shot him without realizing it. The tree just barely grazed my ear, causing me to fall back and lose the light as I heard him groan. The flashlight rolled away from me, creating strange lighting effects as I heard Winnie wheezing and swearing slowly approaching. It sounded like he was crawling towards me. I must have hit him somewhere, but that didn't stop him. The problem was that I couldn't shoot in the dark because I might hit Danny. Instead of just getting up, I also crawled back towards the flashlight. The guy was motivated, I had to admit. On the other hand, he was fighting for his life, just like me. This thought spurred me on even more, and I soon reached the restless flashlight. Pointing it directly at him, I saw his face clearly for the first time. He obviously took a lot of hits too. You fucking bastard, he greeted me. Hey Vinny, long time no see, I said, trying to convince both of us that I was one hell of a badass. None of us bought it. At least I stood up to stop the humiliating crawling. Vinny looked at me contemptuously with his one good eye. You won't shoot me. You don't have the courage. You turned your back for years while I had Doris. I think you even liked it, right? I didn't really care about her, you know. It doesn't matter, you're too weak to kill me. He wanted to egg me on, which didn't seem like the best strategy when there's a guy standing in front of you with a gun. However, what he said could be true. I had never intentionally hurt anyone, and it seemed unlikely that I would be able to pull the trigger. In that case, he will kill me. He was wrong about me accepting Doris cheating, though. I didn't really know anything, and I certainly didn't enjoy it. We both looked to the right, where the flashlight showed a gun on the floor. It didn't matter if it was his or Danny's. He grinned at me with disdain, moving his right hand towards the gun. Days. He grabbed it. He will kill Danny too. I couldn't let that happen. He started to lift it towards me. 
I fired. This surprised me as much as it surprised him. I actually killed a man. One more, to be exact. I hope this doesn't become a habit. You. He said before his head and right arm fell to the floor. I couldn't let my conflicting emotions take over. This could happen later. Right now, saving Danny was a priority. What's taking so long? She joked. She watched the entire scene, and the anxiety had just left her pretty face. You know how it is. You meet old friends, and it takes forever to get rid of them. I hope he doesn't bother you anymore. I don't think it will. I'm sure of it. Looks like he's had his fill. That's good, but we're really going to have to talk about the double shot, Michael. One shot may not be enough if you want to succeed in this business in the long run. Wait, what? You said you're not a killer. No, I said that I was not him at the time of our meeting. I was just kidding, though. I'm done with any work. You can take me to the hospital. My leg seems to be a little off. As you command, my lady. Her leg was indeed broken, as were two of her fingers. The rest is just bruises and cuts. Our bike accident story seemed a little far-fetched to me, but either the doctor wasn't suspicious, or he was glad to have an excuse to move on to other patients and not waste time calling the cops. Danny had to stay in the hospital for five days, and I visited her the entire time. I brought flowers, sweets, and magazines. I was terribly afraid that she would break off relations with me as soon as the threat disappeared. She was just as nervous. She refused to let go of my hand when I was next to her bed. She looked pathetically worried as I left for home. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. Danny, I don't know what you're planning to do, but I love you and I'm not going anywhere unless you kick me out. She sighed and visibly relaxed, pulling me closer to her. Yes, she whispered with a satisfied smile. Yes, I didn't ask the question. I know, but my answer will always be yes. I love you too, Michael, and I'm yours if you want me. Fine. Okay, I could only sigh, feeling the tension go away. We sat there for a while, just enjoying the moment together. You can ask the damn question now, she said quietly. What? No need for the what now, okay? Her sense of humor returned quickly. I decided that she was getting better. Then it finally dawned on me. Danny Averson, will you marry me? Will you become my wife? She exclaimed quietly in such a sweet way. I already answered this. But since you are sometimes slow, yes, the answer will always be yes. She pulled me in for a really, really nice kiss. I'd love to marry you, Michael. Now it was my turn to exclaim. What took you so long? She asked, still smiling with contentment. I knew you were the one for a long time. My damn insecurities... I replied, but I'm working on it. Honestly, I'm working. We never returned to her house. I used my training and removed the bodies while she was in the hospital and hired someone to begin repairs. After our quickie wedding in Las Vegas, where her beautiful white dress hid the cast on one leg, we started looking for a nice venue without bad memories. She said this was the fresh start we needed, and I didn't mind. I was incredibly happy, and the fact that she had more money than me had nothing to do with it. Burying the empty turquoise suitcase was my last symbolic farewell to the life of an unfortunate vending machine technician. We tried to burn it, but the damn thing wouldn't burn. When Danny finally stopped laughing, she said he wasn't burning because he was too ugly to die, and we'd have to bury him, so we dug a hole together and threw him in there. I said goodbye to Doris because I thought I had to and then turned happily to my new wife with her beautiful smile and my new life. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.